All right. Welcome back to the Autistic Tidbits and Tangents podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Kara Diamond. I'm an autistic teacher, university lecturer, author, presenter, coach from Toronto, Ontario in Canada. Hello, everybody. I was going to say good morning because it's early for me. Uh, my name is Bruce Petherick. I am a angry autistic right now, filled with passion, which may come out in the next little little period. Um, I am the <laughs> autistic advocate for Autism Canada, and also very much so a professional musician and parent. And we keep on saying nerd. And I live in the wonderful metropolitan Vancouver area in British Columbia, Canada. I can't so say So beautiful. Oh, you, you sound it. Say it fine. All right. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, changing the narrative. What is the narrative we would like to see about autism, especially in, a, in conferences and educational settings that are often designed without us, without our involvement? Welcome to Autistic Tidbits and Tangents. Candid conversations between autistic off-hour professionals. With lots of tangents in different accents. <laughs> cool. Trigger warnings for this episode include ableism across settings, or statistics related to autistic outcomes, uh, suicidal ideation and suicide, narratives related to fixing or curing differences, and medications. So Bruce, I'm going to hand it over to you because I think you have lots to, to rant about, to talk about. Uh, what's on your noggin? Thank you. So we had a conference this week uh, here in Canada um, that caused some passion for me, caused some, some uh, maybe, let's say, annoyance. Um, it's so we have a national autism strategy here in Canada. The federal government passed it last year, and we're still building on what this actually means. And this was the second conference about this, this, this topic. I couldn't make more than 15 minutes in, in the conference. The, the chat was completely unmoderated, um, and there were people trying to sell not very good services about how to cure autism. There That's were um, caregivers complaining about their specific um, uh, specific problems. Yeah. But this was a national conference about a strategy. They're not going to learn anything. There were autistic people who were so narrow focused on what was wrong with them. And not that I don't want to hear that, not that, that I'm, I'm disregarding that being important, but again, needing to broaden the, the narrative. Macro and, thinking, yeah. Yep. And then un unfortunately, the first thing that was stated was 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 the person introduced in the conference talked about how her family suffered from autism. And it and it's like, I, I I'm done with this. I, I don't want to in engage with this anymore. So I realized that I still see so many of the conferences that happen, the so many of the meetings are so broad. And also often so, so narrow that we miss all the important parts. We, we, yeah. we miss the breadth of our autistic presentation. And I, I want to, I'm, I'm ranting. I want to bring up a little point here. And I, I'm, I'm looking up on my phone just to make sure I've got the, the data right. Um, this is, okay, this is from WebMD. So the touch of maybe... Let's let's Grr. just be really careful about this. Grain of salt, okay. A, grain, a little grain of salt, thank you. Now, I was thinking this morning. I am legally blind. If I take my glasses off, I actually am legally blind. Um, uh, I have um, almost no. I actually have to I have to guess it because I'm now getting old. My right eye. I I, I was born a congenital um, problem with my eye, it's misshaped slightly. And if I take my glasses off, I can see maybe twenty percent. And it makes me it, actually in Australia, it makes me legally blind, which, which yeah. I'm amused about because actually with my glasses on, 
um, I'm fine. And I have another point about extrasensory stuff. I'll talk about later, perhaps. Anyway, I was thinking about, okay, when we look at supports for visible disabilities, and let's just talk about deaf, hard of hearing, blind, um, MLDI, I think it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What does that actually mean? And I thought, I don't think, if we think about a blind person, I think most people think of somebody who has absolutely no vision. Yes. And I thought, that's not right. That's actually not accurate. And I've just looked it up. Mm-hmm. And according to this article, and I've actually double-checked this with two other references, some numbers are about the same, only 15% of people who are blind cannot see anything, which means that there is 85% of people who are blind that have some sight. And, and that's... Yes. that. That's certainly my my um, lived experience. Take my glasses off. I am legally blind. Yeah. Yes, there are some things that are very difficult for me to take out. But generally, I you know I can drive without my glasses. It mm-hmm. perhaps, especially since I'm now sixty, I probably shouldn't, and that's fine. But it's like you know I can actually interact with the world. But some things are still a struggle. Okay, cool. Do you have you have something you wanted to say? Oh, I, I see where you're going with this. Like if all of the interventions and supports were predicated on the idea that everyone who is blind has no vision, you would not get the appropriate support. Autistic people. Yes, there are autistic people with high levels of support. There are there are there are autistic people who need 24-7 support. Good. Get that. That is so much the focus. That's so much the focus when we look at national strategies, we look at supports and resources. It seems the world only sees that. And and I'm going to say 15%. I I don't know what the figures are because that's we don't talk about functioning anymore, as we shouldn't. But if we think of 15% of blind people are totally blind, and we think of you know, 15% of autistic people need extreme support services, that still leaves 85% of us struggling. And that still leaves 85% of us unemployed. It leaves um, us seven times more likely to die by suicide, it, you know, early death for autistic people compared to the general population, because there's such a lack of support and it like it's hard to navigate the world that we live in. And so now this is like the, this podcast is like, how can Sort of what are your and I ideas of how we can change this narrative? Um, do you have a, an idea? I mean, listening to autistic people would be a good good one. I, like, I think there are many wonderful professionals who can still do trainings and um, provide advice. But one of the most important things is... Are you listening to voices in the community? Are you aware of what is important to autistic people? What is your idea of autistic (laughs) well-being? Because is it about making life easier for teachers and family and adjacent people? Or is it actually about making life better for the autistic person in front of you? Now, on that point... Let's talk about your profession and my somewhat profession in education. When you and I talk about enhancing autistic education, yes, we all have a secret plan. In fact, we're talking about everybody, universal design. But when we talk about autistic education, yes, the actually autistic person is important. But you and I also always talk about that triangle of the autistic person, the student, the teacher and the caregiver and community and how those three all need to be talking. And so it's it's mm-hmm. also like I don't want the people to think that we're, we're throwing away the allies and, yeah. the, and, and the community, like the general community, but it is a – we need to be – we need to be a bit more of a focus. We There needs to be a, a, a breadth of focus. That doesn't really make sense, really, does it? Um, oh, but I, I understand what you're saying. Um, working, um, I don't know, has it been 14 or 15 years now? It's been a long time 
that I've been teaching autistic students and working with their families, working with their teachers. And one thing that I've learned over that time, although I've learned many things, but one of the main things I've learned is when adults assume they know what the struggle is, they try to do things like they try to intervene. And often those interventions are unsuccessful because they haven't actually said, what part of this is hard for you? Why are you struggling with this? Where, where, what are the barriers? When you investigate the barriers, instead of like making assumptions, you can actually have a more targeted plan and figure out like what the support needs actually are. Sometimes you might be right. Sometimes our hypotheses as professionals or, or caregivers are right. But often we assume one thing is the problem, but what the student is actually, a child is actually struggling with is something else. Like student voice is so important. And then any plan you're putting in place to make things easier also needs to include the student. Otherwise it's like a unilateral, uh, you know, we're going to do this. And if people don't have a voice in what happens to them, they're not very invested either. So they need to agree this is a problem and have a say in the solution. Assume competency. As, yeah. And again, so what can be what you've just beautifully described about education is the same in workplace. It's the same in general community. Medical field, you know. It, you know, in, in, in our whole lives, this idea that we are not we are not competent enough to answer the questions about us ourselves because of this weird view. And in my presentations, I often talk about uh, there is this concept when I talk about competency that um, people think that we either have huge cognitive challenges or that we're Cara and Bruce and nothing needs to be explained to us. No. <laughs> Which is hilarious. <laughs> but the, the truth is our cognitive differences are a huge spectrum, just like it is in the general population. But people only see it's either this or this. And like you can have a PhD and still struggle with understanding things. You can still struggle with suicidal ideation, with emotional regulation, with all these things, um, managing stress, like you know, it's not one or the other. Our functioning is always sort of up and down like a roller coaster. And sometimes there's way too many loop-de-loops, you know? So, okay, how do we change this narrative? How do we change? How do we, we change this? We invite in nuance and, and the rigidity of thinking, the all or nothing thinking of uh, neurotypicals <laughs> when it no. comes to autism. <laughs> It's a challenge. I mean, I've been challenged that I'm a black and white thinker. This is okay. This is the thing. I think everyone, it's, it's a human trait to be a black and white thinker in some things, but then that becomes something we pathologize about other people. You know what I mean? Like, yes, I can definitely be a black and white thinker. Maybe that is one of my autistic traits, but neurotypical people are very black and white in their thinking as well. Just like the double empathy problem shows like, it, it can be hard for us as autistic people, for sure, to understand other perspectives. But it's definitely hard for neurotypicals to understand our perspective. Like, these are just human traits <laughs> when, when uh, yeah. So, it, as a challenge for you, and because I know you so well, I think this is a good challenge. Where do you see yourself as a black and white thinker? Oh, my gosh. It comes up quite frequently, <laughs> I would say. I mean, I think I'm... Depends how hard I'm masking. Let's say that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think I can be pretty flexible in a lot of ways. I think I try to do a very good job of understanding everyone's perspective. Like I'm, I, I really, that's a huge part of my people pleasing, but I will get very stuck if something does not go the way that I think it should. Um, if something is an unfair decision uh, or, or rule, um, if uh, I, I, I have very specific rules for things, I guess, internally about things. Like I, I don't like people just inviting themselves over. I would get really stuck with something like that. I hate having, you know, workmen in my house. I can't do anything else. Like I have lots of things where I will get really, really stuck because I feel deeply uncomfortable. Um, I 
I'm trying to think of more specific examples because like they do come up frequently. I don't particularly love to be corrected. I have a lot of like rejection sensitivity. And no, so I think com- you're wrong there, but <laughs> No, even like my partner will will give me feedback about things and I'll like, I'll make a face. Like he, he makes fun of the face that I make sometimes when I'm like, you're telling me what to do. Don't tell me what to do. Um, yeah, I it, it definitely come every day. I would say there's at least one example of me getting really stuck on something. So is that black and white thinking? Now, now the first one you okay. first one you mentioned, I almost if I had asked myself, Bruce, what's Kara going to say? The first thing I thought you were going to say was about fairness or equity. And it's like, okay, let's pop yeah. that aside for a second. And that's I one think- that re- I find really debilitating because I can't fix it. Do you know what I mean? And it's systemic issues and it I, I will be filled with anxiety forever because of, of that. Okay. So, I, and I want to talk about, actually, I'm going to write this down. Equity. Uh, the <laughs> other examples, like... Having workmen in your house, why is that black and white thinking rather than you're socially uncomfortable? Mm-hmm. And that, I don't think that's black and white thinking. I, maybe, I, maybe not. I don't. You and I have, um, I have stayed in your house for two weeks over two periods. And yeah. I recognize that that was things you and I had to work up to. The time that I found the week ridiculously pleasurable. I, I, I hope that was the same. And you know, yeah. don't say it's not if it was public. But I also <laughs> knew that I'm not just going to catch a plane and drop into you this afternoon. Yeah, like yeah. I know that because it's like I would feel that. Make you know, this is my space, and, and yeah. yes, I I want you to share this space. Except we don't have an extra room. Um, but boy, there needs to be planning. Yeah, now, I don't think that's black and white thinking myself. No. Um. It's, so let's let's talk about the equity. And certainly this is the black and white thinking I struggle with when things are unfair. And I often I I think I can see both sides, but there are times where my comprehension brick walls. And so it's things like Certain political figures in a country to the south of us, I do not understand that person. I do not understand how random they are. I do not understand how um, there's so much about his behavior that makes absolutely no sense to me. And I have this wonderful filter that when things are really don't make any sense to me, they just disappear. But mm-hmm. it means that... <sighs> It means that when really horrible things happen, they really it it's suddenly like I filtered it out and then suddenly this big reality check for me occurs. And it that's really upsetting for me. Um I had a student involved in a car crash a period of a week ago. Um yeah. it's a student I only ta- I only was taught them for a year. Um they made a positive impression on me. We kept them message on, on Instagram once in a little while. Um, but she got involved in a car crash and and that right now I'm not too sure what's going to happen. Oh my gosh. Um, but it's just suddenly like, oh yeah, there's that reality of mortality. And yep. they're still in hospital right now. Um and that just became a big, you know, this big thing that came came to me. But but anyway, so for me, when things are unfair, have a similar problem to you. It becomes so distressing. Um, but sometimes I can just filter it out. I wish I could. I wish I could filter it out instead of being like, I now need to leave my job or whatever it is. You know, it that I guess that's all or nothing thinking too. Sometimes my reaction to stressful situations, um, I either am like, somebody else needs to solve this, or I need to like self-sabotage and like <laughs> there's no point anymore, you know. <laughs> I, uh... Okay, so is this black? I haven't thought about this black and white so much until now, and I'm I'm starting to get realizing even I've made that. Yeah, we can be black and white. I, I get that, but I 
I it's think like not seeing the options, not seeing all the options that we might have and the agency that we might have would be situations where, or the opposite. I see the agency we have, but let's say, let's say I'm part of a team and there's an unfair decision made. Everyone hates it. I'm the only one saying something. I'm the canary in the coal mine and no one else, everyone enjoys that I speak up about things, but they don't necessarily back me up and they go, well, you know, they, they said, that's just how it is. We just have to accept it. We don't like it. It's like, well, actually, if we all said what we don't like about it, maybe there could be change. And I find that really difficult. Like the burden. So this is the way we can change the narrative, right? And, and certainly you and I share this. I, 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 I was relatively well known in the musical community for speaking my speaking what I thought was the truth. And people have often said to me, Oh, you shouldn't like give be so judgmental about it. And it's like, you know what? Here's the problem I have with it. Everybody's judgmental. I am making, and, and most of this was um an example, somebody coming to me for coaching, for, for, for musical theatre coaching, and asking, am I going to make it in the professional world? How do you know? <laughs> well, so I can say, do you really want to know the answer? Yeah. I can give you an honest answer. And I say yes. And I say no because or yes because. But then there's always the, this is just my judgment at the time. This is not the, This is not what is going to happen. But it's still, I can speak this truth. I can be yeah. very objective about things like this yes. and i think this is an autistic trait we can see down the line and see problems and see and anticipate things and say you know well that doesn't make sense or that's not logical or these are going to be the potential roadblocks you face and and, and and yes one then then sometimes you get hate for it but it's like you know what i'll take the hate because nobody else is speaking the truth i don't want the hate because of rejection sensitivity but and it's that's a <laughs> Yeah. I don't want the hate either. I mean, I, I think you feel it deeper than I, I do. I have but dread it's... about my books, right? I have one book out. There's some things that I would change. I have dread about my second book, and I don't know what the problems are with it, but I know there will be problems. And I'm like, please don't. Like, I almost don't want people to read my work because I find it so scary. Um, and, you know, although I own the things that I would change in book number one, and I stand by 95% of it. I wouldn't talk about rewards. I would use all identity first language. It'd be nice if I'd written it when I knew I was autistic. Uh, you know, there, there, there's a few mm -hmm. things there. I, you know, I talk about some tensions as a teacher and, you know, a student missing a trip and like how sick that made me feel that's in there. But it did make me feel sick and there weren't options with that level. Yeah, I didn't, didn't have other options. That's speaking the truth, though. But they're like, all things that... You know, you never know if people are going to judge you based on your previous writings rather than your evolution, right? And where I am now as a person is very different than where I was in 2018 when I was writing the book. But even then, and I like, I get across the idea of double empathy, but I didn't know about double empathy specifically as a theory. I wish that was in there. And, um, I, I mean, quite honestly, you and I could go and look at the last 15 years of our work. And realize that we invented a whole bunch of like really concepts that are out there. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. I, I think you often talk about, you catch me doing this so often. And it's just like, I'm just, I'm just throwing ideas out here. It's like, I mean, like, is yeah. this not just obvious? And again, yes. I want to come back to this being how to change the narrative is. Being aware that we mask the truth, but realizing that if we can speak what we see as the truth more and we bring some people along, it's better for everybody. Totally agree. I, I People often say, like, you just want me to be right. No, 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 no. I've got this now. I don't, actually, I don't like being right. I really, really don't. What I want people to be is to know the facts. Yes. But I'm also very experienced enough to know that a fact is a political, sociological mm -hmm. comment mm -hmm. and facts change. 
Mm-hmm. Even scientific facts change as we learn more, and that's completely okay. Again, let's think about what autism was 20 years ago, medically speaking, and what autism is now. There was a there was an article just um just shared with me yesterday about MRIs giving 80% positive um clues on genetic factors for autism. Oh wow. And it's like, well, okay. And you and I read, saw some research presented two years ago about genetic markers for ADHD and autism. And like, okay, it's like, okay, we, we know about that. The articles don't talk about, well, this one doesn't talk about environmental expression because, and this is a problem with if any genetic markers, we have genetic markers for a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of things. Yeah. But it depends on environmental expression, whether they get expressed or they just become repressed. And yeah. that's, that's fine. Okay, so that's good. But this is the facts change. We know more. as Every single day, we know more uh, when our facts change. But if we speak the truth and start encouraging other people to, it's going to make the world better. It's going to change the narrative. In your situation, in, in your work, and in my situation, Judging somebody's chances of professionalism. Now, I, I used to do the same thing as younger as a soccer coach. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and when I first came to Canada, I was coaching this really like lovely set of kids. Like just this was like a I think they were under 12 division four. If these kids could run without falling over, like it, it it's amazing. And and yeah, uh, to share a story. They were, they mm-hmm. were, that was a bad team. They had a really bad coach, like a really um, obnoxious coach. So I was just trying to let them play. Our very last game of the season, we won. And the op- opposition team also hadn't had, hadn't, hadn't had a really bad season. They yes. scored both set of kids to like a lap of honor, both <laughs> teams, because both teams scored and oh, neither wow. of them had scored through this season. And it's just like, win. <laughs> Win, 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 win. Yeah. But then one of the ki- one of the parents came to me and said, "Oh, I'm thinking of putting my kid into a, like a soccer camp, and you know, sending him off to the United States to do this summer camp for soccer. Do you think they'll make him as, as a professional, you know, as as a as a player?" And I said, "Are they in the national team right now? Are they like in an under fourteen, under sixteen national team? No, they're not. No, I don't think it is. Like, I may be wrong, but it's like if you're not in the system." In a yeah. sport by by fourteen or sixteen, the chances of you becoming a professional soccer player, even if you're the best in the world, is yeah. minimal. And yeah. it's the same thing of you know, it's the same thing. You you listen to somebody sing, um, and you think, and they say, well, you think I'll I'll, I'll be I'll be great. And it's like, look, I can hear you. Know, I'm seeing great huge kinks in your in your in your voice. Um, there's lack of maturity, blah 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 blah. Um, but you're only seventeen, eighteen. You yeah, know, maybe. But right now, no. And like. I, 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 two examples coming to head my head right now. I was wrong, and, and in fact, um, this person asked two people, uh, another person whose judgment I, I trust implicitly, and we both thought no. They ended up doing a master's in vocal performance in, in yeah, Vienna. Yeah. And it's like great. I was wrong. Great, that's yeah. cool. Anyway, but it's this: if we are encouraged to speak up and not think about it being black and white, but just the truth as it is, and we get neurotypicals to come up with us, that's a way of changing the narrative. Yes. Yeah, that's true. It's just, will the message be heard? Because, I mean, if there's anything that I've learned, it's that, uh, you know, I'm sure there are exceptions to this generalization I'm about to make, but often with people who are not autistic, they want all messages sort of cushioned in nice social packaging. Um, and so they don't particularly like the Cassandras, the people going, hey, I think we might have a problem. Have you thought about this? Or, uh, you know, we really should build something in so that this doesn't happen, or we need a solution to this problem. They don't like to be told that an idea they have may have some fallout. They have to sometimes experience that for themselves. Uh, and they don't always like preventatively uh, change plans. It's always sort of in reaction. So whose problem is that? Theirs, but it's it's hard to watch a train wreck. You know? Yeah, and, and that's true. <laughs> Actually, there's a there's a book in the um, behind Whoops. me 
Go on. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Sure. It's hard to stop a train wreck. And it's also, you know, one of our talents potentially is noticing things before other people. So to then have our talent not honored, not accepted, not, you know, embraced for the strength that it actually is to have people who notice different parts of the process and who like, who can go, Hey, let's fix this before it's a problem before it affects other people. Like it would be so nice if that was welcomed in, in organizations in the workplace, in in any place, really, but I'm specifically thinking of workplace examples. It's become obvious to me that one thing, one of our strengths that is not talked about enough is our abilities to see connections. Yes. And it's kind of, it's, it's interesting that as we talk about we're um, logical problem solvers and, and things, but, but um, I have a, there's a, friend slash ex-client of mine who's made their entire life has been connecting people together. They can see, they can meet somebody and go, hey, you've got this idea and person B had this idea and together you're going to make a great thing. And he he did connections. And I've I've talked to so many autistics in the last couple of years. I now notice this pattern. And I noticed for me, like, um, I was really, really, I was really good at casting, really good at casting. Yeah. yeah. Because I can see, I think I can see the connections. I can see um, advantages and disadvantages really, really quickly and, and connect yeah. them. I, I don't think this strength is, 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 is expressed enough in, in the media. Um, the book behind me, which is, Unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about the book because I don't think very much of the book, but (laughs) it's very much about how to get neurodivergent people into workforces. And it's only giving a financial response. It's businesses make more money if you have more neurodiverse people. A neoliberal argument for the value of autistic people. Gotcha. Or neurodivergent people. Yeah. However, there there were things about in this book about how important it is to have people like us that can see a problem with an idea. And I never want to destroy somebody's idea unless it's unless it's really wrong. And 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 the hope is that more people would see that it's really wrong. But to point out little problems with a big idea i think is so positive i do too and i think question like asking questions is important i think sometimes it's misinterpreted because people who are non-autistic tend to be more hierarchical in their thinking and then they 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 see it as sort of like a um like a threat to power to ask a question or say hey, i'm wondering about this or why is it done this way or could this be a problem <laughs> you know <laughs> I'm smiling because the thought of having power fights. <laughs> uh, there's, been, there's been examples, uh, uh, something completely external, where somebody's accused me of doing something to to take over, and it's like the last thing I want to do is take over anything. <laughs> Quite honestly, like I just, yeah, and yeah. Then, I, mean, I think that I think that's kind of an interesting point is that I they don't think we are. As a culture, and of course, you know, this is that's a big generalization. I don't think we're interested in power. No, not at all. I I, I would be so much happier if everyone else had the power, but uh, all, only if their ideas were uh, fair and just well, and <laughs> made sense you know, and were logical and predictable and all those good things. I've done a lot of my previous. Uh, professional career was done in the shadows. I did work for people. I, 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 I conducted orchestras for people. I wrote film scores for people. I don't get that recognition. And that's completely fine. It's a decision I made when I was in my late teens. And I think it's quite an autistic decision. I want to, again, it's like, I want to do these things. I want to fix the problems. I want to see the connections. But boy, oh boy, oh boy, I don't want the power. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and maybe yeah. that is also a strength. Like, I've always been very good 
as a leader, because I listen to everyone and I'm more of a delegator and I'm able to say, is everyone okay with this plan? Are there any issues with this plan? What do you think? And I'm, I really want people to tell me. And I don't like to make a dis- like a, a unilateral decision. But I think that's a strength. I've always been very, um, I think, fair because of that. And uh, yeah, so uh, maybe that's what we need more of. It's like people who actually don't want to be in power, but want everyone to have a say. We need to go back to that kind of dynamic. So uh, again, in a similar situation, I think I'm a good musical leader because I don't like unilateral decisions and I'd rather have everybody kind of on board, but I can't, I know what I, I do have a unilateral decision. And I've said this too often to when, when, when groups that I'm working with is like, I do have an idea. I know how I know how I want to do this, but I want to hear what you're doing. I just spent um, earlier this week, um, a musical ensemble that I'm part of. Um, I wrote, two pages of it was like some suggestions to make the ensemble a better ensemble and okay. I don't mean from a musical perspective it was much more um, community based and much more personal and it got to the things like it's an orchestra okay so what's the point of the orchestra is the orchestra's point to play better music or is the orchestra's point for the members to to become better people? Yes. Now, it was two pages of of some really good thoughts, some things that I'd taken from an extremely good book, that I, a really good book about arts administration, um, but also some of my own experience. And I did, yes. here's, the, here's the two things. Now, I said quite clearly, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm... It, I um, here are some suggestions. Here are two pages of suggestions that I've in, I've taken from a whole bunch of things. It's up to you as a board to make these decisions. And then the president said, "Like, do you you know what do you prefer?" And it's like, "I, I have I know exactly how what how I would do it, but that's not the point. This is that's for you. You decide. They are going to talk to me about it. anyway. My opinion yeah. is so. Here are the ideas. My opinion is one of many." Okay, I don't know why this triggered this. Um, as you know, I I moved a few months ago, and I can I tell to- from the background it's all <laughs> yes. green rather than the four hundred one. Yeah, I was going to uh, through some boxes this summer, and I found like some some stuff from high school, and I was musical director of a play at our high school. And I found like two handwritten pages back in front of like a speech I must have given at some point during during this period where I, I was like, you're, you know, you're taking advantage of my kindness. <laughs> and like, just I had to prepare my little speech about, you know, my friends who were all in this play um, and their work ethic in rehearsals. But how autistic, like I went, wow, like I really had to prepare. I, I, it's embarrassing to read. I'm not like I didn't read the whole thing. <laughs> Because it was so long, and I was a teenager, so the emotions are, you know, bigger. And um, but I thought, wow, like even then, I was so conflict adverse, and really had to practice. You know, really had to lay things out clearly before I could say anything to anyone. (laughs) I I wish we had. Well, I've been thinking about time machines, and suddenly we've gone on a huge tangent. Um, Uh, time machines can't exist. Like I, I'm, I'm now sort of done enough thinking about the fact that time machines just cannot uh, can exist. But, but if they did, <laughs> if if they did, like, wouldn't it be wonderful for you and I just to pop back into that situation and just whisper, "You're autistic." Exactly. <laughs> now it's funny. I'm. I'm not sure. I'm really not sure if that would have changed my life. If if somebody had come back to me as a teenager. I I you know what? I think I think it might have shaken my confidence. Um not that I was confident in all things, but certainly like I <laughs> in a lot of ways I was more resilient, not in all, all ways. Um, 
at school, especially, uh, yeah, like I feel like I thought of myself as a really creative out of the box thinker and I had no trouble at this point in my life, like asking teachers, you know what, I'd, I'd rather do an assignment in a different way. I'd rather make a film and write a script and, you know, do it on this topic than uh, write an essay because I'm bored by essays. Also, I don't think I knew how to write an essay properly either until graduate school because no one really took the time to teach me. But um, I just like I had the confidence to ask for things. And usually people said yes. And if they said no, I was prepared to get a no. You know what I mean? Um, and I feel like maybe my internal confidence would have been shaken if 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 I felt pathologized. Um, good, good, you know? good. Because I was thinking <laughs> you're actually describing really positive autistic Trays. Yeah. I mean, um, there there were certainly things like it may, might have made more sense, like being bullied, uh, why, like the social stuff that I sort of resigned myself to at some point in, in middle school. I was like, I'm just not going to have friends or like, this is, I just have to get through the next couple of years and switch schools in high school and try again then. Um, it, like the, it would have been good to have those explanations for why things just weren't working or why people didn't like me. I mean, I had explanations for some of it um, when I switched to an art school and um, I, I, I'm I a good singer and I sort of started getting all the solos and getting cast as the lead in the plays and things like that. And so there was a little bit of, of jealousy sometimes that where people were upset, you know, not to get the things that I was given. And, um, and again, I had to resign myself like, all right, I guess, I guess the other people won't like you, but focus on the arts, focus on your work and get through, you know? So, so we're back to changing the narrative here. And like, I think this is, this is an interesting, we, we've tangent back into the mainstream, which is very unusual for us. You're describing almost the perfect example of what we need to do with expanding the breadth of recognition of autism. You're describing the strengths and challenges you have as an autistic person, which are reality unless we start thinking them in a negative way. So I, I, I would hope now that we, you and I, could whisper into a teenage person's ear in a very appropriate manner. <laughs> <laughs> I went down that path without thinking about it too much and whisper and say, you're autistic and embrace those strengths and weaknesses. Like, I think it's the, you didn't have friends. I had a, I had a very strong circle, but a small circle. Yeah. I probably had, like, I really had, there was one good friend, Tony, throughout my, my, my five years of high school. He and I were very much, not part of the rest of the community and sometimes we'd have we'd, you know we'd have bigger yeah. groups and as we did music and we did chess club and things i think but there was just like these two friends but we were different and then it's like okay be okay with your difference yeah um you talked about you talked about the, the strength of asking being saying i'm i'm bored with essays i want to do something else that again is showing a ability to see different perspectives um, and be strong enough to ask for what you need. Again, that's what we want autistic people to ask, being able to, to have the resilience, have the self-awareness to sort of ask, I struggle with this, so therefore. And, and it's funny, you struggle with essays, you weren't, nobody was taught how to write essays until graduate schools. It's like <laughs> stupidity. <laughs> Um, it's actually a problem with the fact that we've dropped classical education. Yeah, the yeah. Only, probably thing I would talk about. Um, but again, it's like that recognition that you struggled with something and you asked for a, um, um, you asked for accommodation. Flipping, you looked at those artistic strengths, those creative strengths, which we often have as autistic people, and you ran with them, and that became a, a, a being. So, so what I'm saying yeah, is, yeah. like, here is the problem we have: is oh, I can't tell you autistic because you're going to pathologize it. It's like, okay, 
But let's drop the pathology and say you're autistic and this is going to do, you're going to be different. We yeah. are different. We are different from the average. Yeah. Yeah, these are some things that might be hard. These are some things that might be what get you through those things. These are some strengths that you have. And, and I think that's, again, we have to bring more nuance to the conversation, bringing it back to our topic, right? We have to, uh, you know, point out the ways autistic people can thrive, not just, you know, some of our biggest struggles. We have to talk about those things too. Like there's there's no world in <laughs> in which... We neglect talking about stress, anxiety, burnout, emotional regulation, uh, you know, like all of all of those things, uh, sensitivities, sensory sensitivities. Um, but we have to talk about the flip sides, I guess, as well. And, um, you know, because even with like sensory sensitivities, those can be incredible strengths, too. They can be a curse. <laughs> well, <laughs> and know? so part of my presentation, um, I maybe haven't said enough about this, but I'm been part of a, a long multi-year project, which is like the last nine months is all I've done at work is, is present, uh, do free presentations for certain community groups. Um, and in my presentation, I talk about specifically my sensory profile to sound, how it goes up and down. And I talk about how I have oral hyperacuity mm -hmm. and how that means that I, I have, um, I can distinguish and discriminate sound at a much greater level than average person. And not what a strength that is as a musician. My oral hyperacuity means that I can hear things much quicker and process them much quicker than uh, even experienced musicians. But the flip side is being in a restaurant and hearing every single conversation, everything going on, can't filter it and yeah. I have to leave. So, so there's overwhelming. A, yeah. It's a strength. It's a super strength. It's a professionally strong strength. Like this is like world-class strength. And then it has a weakness. Okay, yeah. that's your I, life. That's the reality. Yeah. Mediate it. Yep. Um, I've been talking to a friend. I'll probably get him on the podcast at some point. Um, who is also discovering his own neurodivergence. Um, but both of us, like we, we find you know being in loud settings really overwhelming. We used to go to the pub next to my apartment. Um, you know, when I was in my twenties. Uh, and it was a nice, quiet, sort of dingy pub <laughs> where we could just talk for hours and hours and hours. But if we were in any other setting and there was loud music, like I wouldn't be able to, I can't filter out sounds. And it just becomes like a, like, like, uh, I can't discern anything because there's too much going on. And I get really quiet. It's like I lose my ability to speak because of all of the background noise and, um, yeah, just everyone becomes the Charlie Brown teacher voice. Um, You're going through executive, executive function distress, which is causing the, the, uh, vocal communication, speech communication it, to start to fail. It's, I, I can think of so many times it's happened at parties. I don't remember people's names because like, everything is just so overwhelming. And um, and I also have like slower auditory processing the more this is going on. Um where I'll be like, what, what, what? And there's only so many times you can ask someone to repeat themselves before you just go <laughs> and don't say anything else. Like you smile and nod and hope that what they said was funny, you know? <laughs> so horrible question. Yeah. Would you fix that? Um, I mean, it would be nice to be able to participate in social events and not feel physical distress. I mean, that would be something like maybe, maybe. Um, but also like, I feel like I, I, I mitigated it in a lot of ways by just like avoiding those things. I don't, don't like to go to, um, big social events. I don't like when there's background music. I don't like, um, yeah, I, I avoid those things as best I can. Okay, so so here's the, the the question why it's a horrible question. If you fix those issues, are you also causing some positive things to go into a more negative space? Well, I don't know. Like, I'm just trying to think too. 
and all we can do is speculate anyways, but if you fixed the auditory processing issues that I have, um, would I, okay. Would I enjoy social events more? I I still doubt it. (laughs) I think that's, I think that's a point. And, and so, so, I do not want to fix my oral hyperacuity and my autistic presentation of that. No way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, it's because my entire life has lived that way. But it's like, if I fixed the can't process things in a restaurant, it means I miss, I also would unfix all those Mm -hmm. advantages I have, you know, as a 60-year-old still being able to hear technically better than a a 20-year-old. And I think this is a problem with certain behavior interventions. Yes. Yes. Uh, and in fact, I think this is a problem with the entire, again, going back to changing the narrative. You can't fix negatives without also fixing changing positives of our presentation. There is no way of of changing our sensory sensitivities without changing the positive aspects of those sensitivities, without changing those those. Perhaps our, our ability to hyperfocus is, I think, um, predicated on our trying to filter out sensory sensation. Maybe, yes. Well, and I can ignore everything when I'm hyperfocused. It's really remarkable. Um, and, and and so and you know, there's hyperfocus has negative and positive feelings as well. Hyperfocus is, it, you know, I think the joy I get when I'm composing and I'm, I have a big project coming up and I'm, I'm actually doing some, po- I did some composing just before we started, like that joy of hyper-focus of, of, of compositions mm-hmm. is brilliant. And, and I'm certainly in my autistic happy place and very yes. much, but I'll, I'll forget to wait. Oh, I'll forget to go to the washroom. I'll forget to eat. I'll forget, you know, I, I won't know if someone has spoken to me and that's a problem because I do work with someone like <laughs> in the same room all the time. And I'm like, did she speak to me? I don't know. Did I did I respond? I don't know. Did I say this to her? I'm going to just repeat myself like all the time. <laughs> I, I, I was writing last night, like at 930, um, this idea that I'm working on this morning, I was writing and I suddenly got this sensation turned around and my daughter had come home from work. I didn't realize. And she's coming to say good night. And I think she said, stood there for five minutes. Oh my gosh. Yep. I've been there, (laughs) but at least she understands you. Imagine if it was someone who didn't understand you in the family. That's kind of okay. Um, and and I know have caused distress to certain friends. Um, I, I I have walked past. There's a, there's a friend I'm just reconnecting with now, but they were a little weirded out because I ignore them in the store. And it's like, I if I'm at the, that particular store up the road here, it is such an overwhelming place. I could basically I don't think I would miss Meredith, but I've probably missed the kids. I probably would not know the kids were right next to me or standing in front of me because I'm just trying to get all just through it because it's such yeah. an overwhelm for me. Same thing when I'm on the street sometimes. Yeah. That you, you'll you'll just you'll you'll ignore them, but in fact what it is is we are dealing with the sensory issues so much. Yes. Um, that's true. Like, I don't always focus on people's faces. Uh, so, uh, like, I, I'm, I would recognize maybe their outfit if it was the same day, but if they're in different clothing, I might not. Unless, like, yeah, all the time I would say, I meet so many people, I don't store their faces. <laughs> and that can be awkward because I won't remember them necessarily. And I'll do that thing where you, like, pretend <laughs> uh, if they recognize me. And I'm like, <laughs> It's, you're probably from one of the schools I work in. Okay, let's let's try to figure this out. Um, but yeah, no, uh, fix fixing our differences. I, 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 I am sure there are many autistic people that have certain things that if they could get rid of, it would make their life easier. They would. Um, and I, I, I think people should feel however they feel about their own autistic experience. Um, if I, mean, I may interrupt, may mm-hmm. interrupt. Yeah, so of course, please. I, w- I, I wonder if that's a challenge. I wonder actually if the problem with those people who want to fix a difference are not seeing a bigger subtle picture. I wonder if those people are having 
big challenges and would fix one thing don't recognize fixing that one thing would make a whole bunch of things maybe worse. Oh, when I think about our, our brethren who, uh, um, you know, maybe have things like severe depression who have, uh, like, if I could, if I could cure my anxiety, I might, even though I see there are some value in, in, you know, being an anxious person, it's because I think forward so much, you know? Um, and is your anxiety, is if you looked at the cause of the anxiety and accepting it a better solution than fixing the anxiety? Oh, I, I feel like I throw all my money at therapy to try and answer that question. I don't know. <laughs> I just, I, do. I would like, you know what I want? I want like three weeks where I have no responsibility, nothing to do. And I can just like not experience anxiety, like no demands. I just want a little bubble because hmm. it's hard to, it's hard to fathom not being anxious. It's hard to fathom not overthinking. It's hard to fathom an end to being anxious other than, you know, death. No, and I'm, I'm not saying that in like, but it's like, that's the only, I, I will be anxious until the day I die. Yeah, for sure. And I don't, I don't, I, you know, uh, but I, again, the flip side, flip siding this a lot today. Um, while I have the anxiety, I also love the intensity of other emotions that I have. So. Uh, you know, I, I think people should access medication when they want to, when they need it. Uh, do I want something specifically for anxiety? Not if it mutes my other emotions. Um, I am considering, and I'd love to hear in the chat if anyone um, is on ADHD medication. I'm considering that. I've heard that that can have a, an impact on emotional regulation. And and certainly a lot of my, my stressors are executive functioning related. And so maybe Certainly. maybe that'll make some difference too. I don't know. My, my family are all on ADHD medication, and all three of them have found it an extremely positive experience. And when they're off, it's a cray cray ensemble. Mm -hmm. I I I've had several friends who have recently tried different ADHD meds, and so so this is the caveat I want to say to everyone: if you are going on or are trialing a new medication, an ADHD medication, be aware that you need to be working with a medical professional who's going to monitor your experience, um, who can adjust dosage as needed, maybe switch to a different one if you're having too many side effects that you don't enjoy. Like you have to have that communication because mm -hmm. there are ways to adjust your plan. Um, it's not just one and done, you know, you, you, um, having someone who will monitor you and work with you and ask you questions about your experience is really important. I had two friends who switched, I think from Concerta to Vyvanse, both for different reasons, but they'd had a bad experience on one and had a really good experience on the other. So, And certainly all three have gone through different types and medication dosages and we, and we have been fortunate that both um, for the kids, we had pediatricians both here and um, back in that place I used to live who were so careful and encouraging. So it's like, we're going to try in this dose for four weeks. If it's really bad, call me. Otherwise, come back in four weeks and we'll check. And then it was like, it was it actually sometimes from a parental perspective, it was a little frustrating because we kind of wanted, we knew we needed the dosage up it up upped, but it also it's like let's trust the process, and and almost always the pediatrician go, yep, I agree, or you know what, no, because the next jump is you know you're not jumping five milligrams, you're jumping twenty milligrams. I think it's too strong. It's like cool, we trust your judgment. So yes, yes, but okay. where like how do we if that's Okay, what what's the line between making life more comfortable and bearable and fixing differences? Uh, There's a big difference because okay, tell me. with the with the medication, that's a choice. You make that point; it's a choice. And and with ADHD medication, you like, like people forget, and their lives go on. Yes, when the kids forget at school, 
they may have to come home early because they've just they're done with the day. That's okay. The life continues. The life has, in general, got their experience has been um, enhanced, but they're also really aware of their differences and those differences being positive and negative. So the point about fixing a difference is it's permanent. With a medication, in this sense, you're altering an experience for a temporary perspective. Your anxiety, you probably have generalized anxiety, and and I'm guessing this, and you don't have to disclose this, but this is like you're also presenting female or that you are, you're left-handed, right? Yes, I am. Yeah, like, okay, you were left-handed. That's wrong 100 years ago. It's a difference. You have generalized anxiety. I have a heart condition. Like, it's like, okay, if it was perfect, we'd be all the same. Well, and oh, okay, here, here's something I've been thinking about too. Um, I think it would be cool in schools to teach about strengths and weaknesses the way you'd like create like D&D characters where you have your stats and abilities and some are like, some are going to be advantageous in some settings and some are n- not so much. And you need your, your teammates, you need your core group to, <laughs> to have all the strengths. <laughs> So let me drill down. Fixing our differences are wrong because what we should be fixing is the acceptance and the recognition that we are neurologically different, but people struggle with a whole bunch of things and we need to be more as a community, as a world, embracing that difference rather mm-hmm. than trying to fix it all. Your d and it's a great example. You, you've got your... You've got your um, But what's this swordsman? Um, um, <laughs> fighters? Yeah, sure. You got you got I, your I, fighters. I'm, you got I'm your about ranged. To, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm about to 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 start a DM DMing a campaign here. I've oh, forgotten. Cool. I mean, warriors. We have our warriors. They go mm-hmm. in with the sword and they swing. We got our magic users swing back, going zoom 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 zoom. You got your clerics going heal yeah. heal heal. <laughs> your thief going around the corner. These are all differences. They all have strengths, they all have weaknesses, and we accept that. In the school, we often are not accepting the difference. In the world, we're not accepting a difference, but in fact, we should be accepting the difference. We should be um, accepting the idea that people struggle with essays, but they can create a film. And and from an educational perspective, I want to see your interaction with the the content. That's it. (laughs) How you express that is completely up to you. Oh, and so much you... more interesting too as a as an educator. <laughs> and again, we have fixing a problem for the kid, but in fact, you're, you're that's an important point. How difficult it is for teachers to to judge, give feedback on something that's almost identical. The format's oh. identical because we get bored. You do, <laughs> and and and, and I, then it I, like reinforces bell curve thinking because you go, oh, you know what, Bruce is my A student. I, I'm just going to give him an A because I know he always gets the A, and you know it's. And how often have yeah. we done that? How often have we done the student that's the A student and the and the and the E student that we don't even look at what they produce because it's like cursory, and and I'm not. I'm not blaming me. I'm not blaming you. And blame, it's like it's blaming the system. We have 30 identical things to look at, and we've got well, infinite hours, but in fact, in tr- truth, like two or three hours. And so much is sub- subjective. And, you know, there's a really great video. Maybe I'll link that. This could be our thing of the day. There's a really great video that I always show um, when I teach graduate studies in education. Uh, and it's, um, two educators and one of them reads a story written by a grade one student to the other teacher. And then they talk about, oh, that has great voice that has, you know, this is a really developing storyteller. And then she shows the other teacher how it's written and it's rife with spelling errors. Like it's almost impossible to read. Um, but if you marked it just on the visual presentation, it would be a very low mark. You so the point of the video is sometimes like you you want your your writers to read their work to you, 
because you will get more information that way. And then later you can work on the mechanics of writing. You can work on the other aspects. But if just on the visual, you'd probably, you know, not that we mark everything we get as teachers, but it would not get a high mark. Whereas when you heard the story read out loud, wow, there's all these really great elements. It's actually a really good story. So how often do we as educators get... um judge a work you know you have someone for whom English is not a first language we're not judging the idea we're judging the things that are harder for them spelling the grammar the you know and really I think nine times out of ten if we're not marking the mechanics of writing we should be looking at the ideas and the presentation and the voice and I would so much rather have something handed in with spelling mistakes than something that was like done by AI you know (laughs) Which has mm. no voice and no personality and, and uh, it's not really engagement with the ideas. So again, this is going back to changing the narrative of what the expectations are. Um, what do we value? The, yeah. yeah. Like in the workplace, this idea that people are being forced to go back to work for reasons that really have historical and maybe neoliberal management issues, but but it's like there are a whole bunch of jobs that people don't need to be in the office for. Yeah. And there's a whole bunch of jobs that you do need to be in the office for. But let's can we not expand the idea of binary black and yeah. white and think of this this merge situation mm-hmm. um agreed and in generalizing that again to, to be looking at acceptances of our differences mm. and accepting our differences what is wrong with being different what is wrong about What's wrong with not having strong mathematical skills if you have strong creative writing skills? And you what just described me. <laughs> well, and and I, I kind of was starting that, and I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to Ka- about Kara, but uh, I didn't mean it in that sense. What's wrong with what is wrong with having two? really strong friends through high school compared to 50. I mean, that's a two sounds so much better. You can actually invest the time. If you have 50, you'd be so drained all the time. And, and, and yes, the proper, the, 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 the yes answer is probably a little bit more like having two strong friends and having maybe 20, like more casual friends. And, yeah. and what is wrong with recognizing? And again, this comes from my presentations. I have, lifelong friendships i have short friendships i have relationships that have been good i have relationships that have been bad i have relationships that have ended differently strangely they've just suddenly stopped i've been married twice once for 23 years and now in the 10th year like what is wrong with that as a recognition of that's my relationships some of them some of them being strong some of the weak Mm -hmm. um I have lost I have lost relationships because of my autistic presentation. I got to be not sad about that. You will have lost friendships because of your gender presentation. You will have lost friendships because of your political persuasion. You have lost friendships for your love of a sport team. <laughs> what is wrong with recognizing that that's what happens? What is wrong with us trying to then think, oh no, no, I've got to, I need more friends. I need more friends. Actually, narrative maybe just sold need one. to us. That's the narrative that's sold to us. Other people say, oh, you need friends, you need friends, you need to, friends at all costs. And they don't teach us how to look for good friends. Um, they don't teach us to sort of stand up for ourselves because it's like you have a friend, you gotta cherish them and hold on to them forever. But friendships come and go. Friendships come and go with age and stage and and you know you outgrow people, you move on, you move to different places. And I think part of the narrative needs to also be including the nuance. Um and just just because we're on the on the topic, my friend Lindsay gave me a friendship bracelet last month. So and I'm happy to be wearing it today. So hello Lindsay. <laughs> 
And can I just say like how healing it is as an almost 40 year old to get a friendship bracelet at this stage in my life, because I think the last one I received was in grade four. And then Michelle asked for it back at a certain point, And I didn't know why. <laughs> I still remember That's, that. It's, it's so sweet. It's so sweet to hear s- stuff like that. Um, it's, and it's, it's probably weird. This is a, a, a gender presentation. It's like, I, I could not imagine a man giving me a friendship place that, you know, what, 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 I get a bottle of scotch or a box of cigars or, you know, I don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> okay. So, so emphasizing this point about changing the narrative. It's that recognition that stuff happens and that we struggle with stuff, but so does everybody else, and that is okay. It's yeah. completely okay for us to parallel play. Yeah. I, 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 this is one of my biggest, I really don't understand why people are so concerned about Policing autistic. play, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. And again, like the theory of play is so broad and people try and narrow it. Um, It's us accepting these differences. It's the world accepting these differences and being okay with it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like if I want to spend all my time as a child reading books, um, reading very advanced books, reading nonfiction Rather than, you know, listening to the Backstreet Boys and whatever else everyone else is doing, like what we do for fun and relaxation, um, it should be highly individualized, right? It should be what makes sense for us as a way of playing, as a way of restoring, as a way of finding pleasure and natural curiosity. Um, So long as it's not hurting anybody else, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure, but... Like, I, I think that that should definitely be part of the narrative is is radical acceptance, accepting there are different ways of doing things. There are different ways of experiencing the world and focusing on comfort and self-advocacy um, and like, you know, metacognition, self-awareness. Uh, what is going on for you? You should write a book about that. Oh, isn't that funny? Because I just did. <laughs> I'll let you know when it's out. <laughs> Um, this was going to be another topic of a podcast, and and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna just push it here because I think it's a brilliant idea that we collectively came up with. But again, it's this as we're talking about changing the narrative and broadening our perspective of play. Let's just use that as an example. What we're doing is also showing the rest of the world that they should also broaden their, their concept. So it's not double empathy. It's double empathy externalized. Yeah. yeah. Um, We should be okay with our differences and we should be encouraging other people to be okay with our differences and And their their differences. Yes. (laughs) And so going on to that point, we raised and we raised this brilliant idea. And I I really think the three of us should should work on this. The idea that um, the world is more complex now than it's ever been. And I posited the, the, the thought that the more we are aware, with the, we're going to be more aware of those the challenges and, and how to fix it. And you've talked about this, um, how we how we prepare for a social um, event, and how we need to have preparation, but also relaxation afterwards. We are aware of how complex social communication can be, yeah. and so should the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. Well, and going back to the thought of black and white thinking, I feel like the very narrow um, approaches that lack nuance, where people are trying to intervene, fix, say, you know, you have to socialize this way, those actually create rigidity because they are rigid systems themselves, lacking nuance. And then they set up expectations that, well, when I, you know, when I, let's say I'm a eight year old child and I'm told this is how you initiate play and I go do that and I'm rejected. 
what's going to happen? You're never going to do that again. No, either you're... either it's complete shutdown, never doing that again, or it's like explosive behavior that further damages the, that because it didn't go how I was told it was supposed to go. We need everything to be more nuanced, to help our expectations, to help other people to understand um, that there are always different pathways, different ways of experiencing things. And there's no, not necessarily a right way for, for most things. Most things, there's multiplicity, right? Um, and we're getting into post-modernity, but uh, <laughs> mul- multiple truths. No one, uh, nothing is objective. <laughs> I am, I am so much. I'm going to be, I'm going to go out on a limb here and surprise the entire world. I am so postmodern. <laughs> and I, some, some people criticize me for saying this. Like, like I am raised in the postmodern period. Like that, where postmodernity comes in as a thought process in the, in the kind of 60s to early 70s, that's the start of my education. Postmodernism was so much part of the thing, and, and so it's it's easy for me to go. There's no there's no singular. I've talked about it before. There's no truth. There we is are, no truth. It's, and it's I all say perspective. All the time, it's all like, political. We're all limited by our own experiences. That's that's one of my catchphrases. Mm. Mm. I think I think we've done a good job of one of the one of the ways we can change the narrative. It's not going to help in our national autism strategy, but I think I, I I'm pleased with what we've what we've what we've talked about today so do we want to talk anything else about the thing of the day uh no i will post it it's just a video on writing assessment and being open to assessing in different ways and uh something i i aim to help teachers to reconceptualize all the time i'll post it it's a great little five minute clip um that just hopefully gets people thinking a little bit well, and that, that there's a truth to your expressing this from an education perspective, but there's a truth about a whole bunch of things, the way we look at way we look at pop music. We're judging pop music by how it looks rather than how it sounds. Mm-hmm. That's not disagreeing that there shouldn't be elements of spec- spectacle now. Yeah. But it's it if you're not a young blonde female singer you're not going to get the, the traction, even though we have, you know, people who don't show that um, presentation um, exactly the same way, still successful. But the majority, it's like it's all about the visual aspect without yeah. thinking about what the, what, the, what the truth is behind that. Yeah. Um, and, yes, pop music may be strange as an example, but it's the same thing with, like, so much politics is on what does the person look like? Yes, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. This was great. I'm glad that uh, we were able to meet up this morning and have this casual chat. We are hoping at some point on this podcast to uh, uh, get back to having some guests, but we've been having trouble scheduling in advance. So you will start seeing some other faces besides ours and hearing some other voices besides ours at some point. But I hope you enjoyed our tangent filled conversation as always. And let us know if there's any topics you want us to talk about uh, in, uh, in the comments section. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Be well. Thank you. Bye.